Okay, so today we'll talk about uh, this uh, North American architect, uh, Arthur Erickson, uh, born in, uh, in uh, 1924 and died in 2009. Uh, unfortunately, I still have to wait a little bit. Now, I don't know if it's my laptop or it's, uh, it's something else. Now I cannot advance with the next slide. Here it is, God. So he died on this day of May 20th, but he was born in June. So we'll, I'll talk again about him on June. So if you, if you are irritated at this moment, and if later you'll regret and you still want to see the presentation, you'll have the chance on June 14th. Arthur Charles Erickson was a Canadian architect and urban planner. He studied Asian languages at the University of British Columbia and later earned a degree from McGill University School of Architecture, uh, both in uh, Canada. He is renowned for designing some of the most recognizable buildings and sites in Canada, including Roy Thompson's Hall, Robin Robson Square, the Museum of Glass, and the Simon Fraser University campus. What is to be noticed here is that he studied first Asian languages, I think this is very important because not too many architects do this sort of thing, but he did. And I think uh, this had a good effect on his architecture because he was, um, uh, you know, more open minded. He had cultural interests beyond architecture. And this is always a good thing. Uh, this is the man. I mean, <laughs> these are his shoes and his uh, trousers and part of his coat. Now we see the other side of him, um, you know, and uh, I like the way he looked when he was young and you will see soon a, a picture of him as a young man. Here he is already kind of a cocky architect, you know, successful and kind of sure of himself. I like him here in this picture, uh, well, not only because he is younger, but he looks more romantic and uh, I don't know, uh, he's contemplating a building that you are going to see, and it is an important building that he built. Drawings, the drawings by Arthur Erickson. Um, you know, architects drawings. Drawings like uh, many, many students and many architects can do. He had the, 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 the luck in a way, and he probably deserved it to build uh, important uh, buildings, uh, very large buildings, but he also built some very interesting private houses. Uh, he even had a visionary side to him, as you can see here, or here, a sketch by Arthur Erickson. Uh, this is a house he built. Uh, this one, I, yeah, he built this one as well, a large uh, university campus. This one he built as well, Arthur L. Erickson layered landscapes, drawings from the Canadian architectural archives. Now we begin with his very early works, 1955, the Killam Massey House in West Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, you know, his architecture is a modernistic architecture, is a modern architecture, but but he has, uh, um, often because of the spectacular landscape, uh, he has an architecture that is, um, you know, difficult to, to, to ignore, visually speaking, because it's, uh, you know, sculptural, it has, uh, uh, it's not a stiff or rigid uh, building, and it's possible that the dialogue with the landscape uh, is, um, uh, you know, uh, has uh, positive effects on, on, on the architecture. 1958, the Philberg residence also in Canada. Um, now these are not, uh, you know, inexpensive uh, houses, of course, but, you know, architects often work for those uh, who have money. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Ideally, yes, we should be able to build for everybody these kind of houses, but it's simply not possible. Also, what I like about his modernism is that he doesn't reject 
at least in his private houses, he doesn't reject organic matter or natural materials, like in this case, stone or wood. So it's not just concrete and steel and glass, but also um, natural materials. Another house in Canada, Edmonton, Alberta in Canada from 1960. Um, but this is, this is an architecture which is interesting, which is acceptable, but it's not totally, you know, totally original. Uh, I mean, it has some qualities in terms of its um, uh, sometimes volumetric freedom, but uh, it, it's a modernism with touches of uh, modernity or even commercialism. Although I like this building because it's, well, it's a large house, but because he fragments it, uh, it it's, it's, it's interesting. It's not just like a, you know, uh, stern uh, monolithical box. It's uh, it's um, uh, it has a sensibility derived exactly from this uh, fragmentation. Even if this fragmentation happens mainly at the at the exterior of the building. Also, the handling of the light matters because here he has um, you know. A light from above, exactly above the, the seating area, the, the, the sofas. Arthur Erickson. Now, another house. He built a lot of houses because, of course, when he began to build, he couldn't get, you know, large commissions being young. He started with, with houses, but these houses, some of them are pretty large. 1963, the Graham House in Vancouver. I love this house. And I, to be honest with you, if I am to compare it with Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright, I don't think this building is uh, inferior. You know, it's, it, it has a, a variety of spaces, a variety of views. It's, it's spectacular. It's, uh, in terms of its uh, volumes, its, its sculptural, it, it has an uh, outgoing um, uh, kind of aesthetics, and it's it's blended within the landscape. You see the water enters underneath the house, kind of like uh, well, not so dramatical dramatically like the falling water, but this is a, a dramatic building by itself. Uh, it's one of his best house houses. Uh, Arthur Erickson uh, building in a, in a special uh, landscape. And uh, the house, I think, has uh, appreciable uh, qualities. I wouldn't mind at all living in such a house. And it would be great. It would be actually a good exercise to compare this building, to analyze it and to compare it with uh, Falling Water by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. It's very different from, from uh, the building by Frank Lloyd Wright, and yet they have something in common. And what is in common is this engagement with nature, with the water. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a dynamic um, engagement uh, with, uh, with uh, what we call nature. For Frank Lloyd Wright, I kept saying yeah, nature was, um, was the the main proof, if not the only proof of God's existence. He was asked, Frank Lloyd Wright was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, I do, but I spell it nature. Another, what is this uh, building in Vancouver? This is not a house. It's a large uh, office building. He already began to build uh, large public buildings. And I think it's a good building. Uh, you know, it's yes, it's Cartesian, but uh, it has force, it has power. And uh, yes, the rhetorics of these, um, you know, cells, all this concrete work uh, is expensive, was expensive, but um, the building is not, uh, is not, uh, it doesn't leave one indifferent, I think, although it is based on a grid, but. Um, I think he has the coherence of, uh, of, uh, of, of strengths. 
Arthur Erickson, an office building, of course. Now another residence, 1965, Smith residence from West Vancouver. You see how he extends the beams here. And uh, the functionalist might say this portion is not necessary, nor this portion here. Certainly it's not for uh, you know, measurable or functional reasons, it's not. But for emotional reasons, it is necessary because it expresses openness, a desire of the building to extend, some kind of a longing, you know, for, uh, to, 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 yeah, to extend, at least emotionally. It's done through physical um, uh, matter, of course, uh, but uh, the, these things matter. They, they, they could be called capricious, and in a way they are, but capriciousness is part of art. You know, it's the subjectivity of the architect who expresses certain emotions. And um, who, who, who said, I think Voltaire said that, uh, you know, the superfluous is necessary. So even something that appears to be superfluous has a raison d'etre, has a, has a reason to be. Now, how you differentiate between a superfluousness which is legitimate and has a raison d'etre and one that doesn't? That's a difficult question. I don't know. But if you are sincere when you make a project, when you are, if you are emotional and you express this emotion through the lines you draw, through the volumes you, you create, uh, that sincerity of feeling I think uh, um, fuels the reality of your project, of your building. It's very important to, to be alive when you make the project, to be intense and to, to feel, and those feelings to, to express. If you don't express those feelings, then the building might be correct, but no more than that. I think a great architecture is more than just a correct building. It has to express emotions, an emotional state. Does this building do this? I think it does in its own way, through the language, architectural language that um, Arthur Erickson employed. <clears throat> now you see there is uh, this interplay between the outside and the inside. I think it's very pleasant to, to live in such a house. Of course, it's an opulent house, it's an affluent house, it was an expensive house, but, but you know, these spaces, you know, you, you, you continuously have, uh, uh, you know, uh, this dialogue between nature and the house. And uh, this can be indeed very, very pleasant, especially since here nature is, is, is quite beautiful. Uh, what is this? The Simon Fraser University, also in British Columbia, 1965, so from uh, almost 60 years ago. Um, he built some large uh, campuses. This is one of them. Um, and this one is, I would say, impressive too. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it has this uh, uh, kind of courtyard, but very large, and then these buildings floating above the ground. Also, I would say the symbolical uh, language here has its, its meaning because, you know, you look at this, uh, you know, this um, lava upstairs or this, yeah, the, you know, they, they they seem to symbolize, you know, uh, the quest for knowledge. You know, it's about growth, personal and otherwise. You grow, you grow towards knowledge. That's why you go to school to, to develop as a human being, uh, professionally, and also hopefully as a society. So this is a university campus. 
again, the landscape is important. And uh, again, the dialogue with nature does take place. This man who initially studied Asian languages, I think had a, an artistic temperament and uh, you know humanistic concerns because those years he spent studying Asian languages, not only that uh, you know brought to his attention uh, you know language, literature, words, letters, uh, alphabets, and so on, but also put him into contact in in this particular case with Asia, with the Orient, which. You, you know, has a very uh, intense and affectionate relationship with nature. So it helped him. It helped him, even if the buildings are definitely Western and, uh, you know, emphatically modern, I think some kind of a, uh, not nostalgia, but some kind of a uh, longing for marrying a building with nature, existed in, 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 in uh, Arthur Erickson. Another house, 1967, this one more um, emphatic in a way, in, 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 you know, in its, uh, uh, you know, uh, asserting itself in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the landscape. It's a little bit rhetorical, but it's uh, certainly interesting and probably very pleasant to live in. Arthur Erickson again, 1967. I was talking just the other day with uh, an interesting architect from the United States and uh, he said, well, you know, the best way to do architecture now is to not build. And uh, I know this is painful news for, for architects and students, but the truth is, we live at a time when we need more nature than buildings. There are already too many buildings in the world and we do have problems. The climate, the warming, the climate warming, the rising levels of the seas, the melting of the icebergs. These are not uh, little things. They are very, very important. The pollution, any constructive effort provokes pollution. The construction industry is responsible for approximately 30% of the pollution in the world. One third, one third of the pollution in the world is provoked by the construction industry because we build madly all over the world with concrete, with whatever concrete pollutes. We still use concrete. As we, but we know it pollutes. We have to build with something. If we build with wood, we have to cut down trees. If we cut down trees, the level of oxygen, which is already very low, becomes even lower. So what can we do? And then there are the, the demagogues like Sir Norman Foster, who continues to build uh, emphatic skyscrapers he claims are sustainable. They are not sustainable. You know, the windows in those towers don't even open. So goodbye natural ventilation. They need an immense mechanical uh, infrastructure to, to have the, the adequate air inside. And air conditioning is another major source of pollution. So, Architects love to talk about sustainability because architects very often are, uh, you know, opportunists and very often demagogues. But the truth of the matter is, if we want more oxygen in the world, if we want to avoid, you know, fatal climate warming, we should abstain from building as much as possible. I understand we cannot, uh, you know, totally give up building, but to restrain ourselves. Unfortunately, I don't see signs that we do that. No, 
even with the cars we think that if we invent uh, if we use now electrical cars we, we we won't have pollution but even the production of electricity is connected with you know with uh, with uh, unsustainability and with the pollution so if we keep running madly on the highways we will continue to contribute to the climate warming what is the solution the solution is to have fewer cars in the world to consume fewer fuels to consume fewer energy of any kind less electricity there are already countries and people and even some architects who try to use as little as possible any kind of resource but the process is very slow and the climate i mean let's face it for the past two years there was no winter in bucharest no winter so this doesn't tell us anything we eliminate at this point we have three seasons not four winter is gone goodbye you know white christmas it's 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 a it's a past thing let's hope we'll do something but again the, the egocentrism of man of the human being is so high we will not give up on our cars we will continue to cut down trees and uh, we we don't care too much you know that if uh, if okay uh, future generations who cares about the future generations the important thing is that i can run on the high, highway right now in fact i understood there is a, a rule in in, in uh, you know in uh, in romania for example for uh, each family to have uh, two cars two cars per family well, two cars, they need parking, they need garage, they need uh, fuel. But nobody is thinking about pollution. Although Bucharest is one of the most polluted uh, uh, cities in Europe. And we don't think about them. The important thing is that each family has two cars. And this way will destroy the earth, no doubt. Government of Canada Pavilion at Expo 70 in Osaka won the top architectural award in August 1970. Unfortunately, from these pictures, I, I can't quite realize very well what the virtues of the building is. It seems mysterious, um, but uh, I, I don't know if I can uh, verbalize more than that in relation with this building. Uh, there were many interesting buildings at the Osaka Expo. The Japanese metabolists participated. And it, it was a very innovative uh, uh, international exhibition, 1970, in Osaka, the city where Tadao Ando was born and where he lives and works. It's his city, Osaka. But at that time in 1970, uh, Tadao Ando was around 30 years old, so he didn't uh, participate in this uh, in this exhibition. Uh, I don't know very well what's going on here. I see these reflections. I see. Well, I, I I don't know if I can say anything really interesting because I, I didn't see uh, the plans of the building, but apparently Arthur Erickson received the, the award for, I guess, the best pavilion within this very important um, uh, World Expo, spoiled with many interesting buildings. It's not a little thing. Now, what is this? A temple for, uh, I don't know what kind of society or uh, religious denomination, Khalsa, D1, the one uh, again because of his education within the field of asian languages he probably had connections with uh, you know asian societies this is uh, uh, you know a religious denomination uh, uh, you know from that area of the world and he built that temple for them in 1970 but in canada in vancouver here it is. Uh, it's not one of my preferred buildings by him, 
maybe he was also, you know, uh, constrained by the specifics of that uh, religion and uh, of the program. I don't know. It's a little, a little bit, for my taste, a little bit too literal, you know, a, a temple for, uh, yes, it is kind of interesting when you see it from this angle, you know, on top of the hill. It's like a citadel, like a fortress, the fortress of spirit. It has some interesting parts inside, uh, you know, the, the, the abs abstractness of the, of, the, of the space, the rotations, uh, but I don't think it's one of his best buildings. Now, another university, University of Lethbridge in Alberta, again, Canada, this is a dramatic building and again he benefits from a spectacular landscape what i like about this building is that in it, it, the, what we have here is harmony through contrast so we have the the we have nature the so-called the language of nature organic irregular wild uh, abrupt and then we have the willful uh, building by the architect and and they are in a, in a, in a dynamic uh, relationship and and this helps it helps the building is uh, literally asserting the will of man but in a in a i would say in a in a in a, in a forceful way in a positive way forceful i would say and uh, i think it works the vastness of the landscape kind of requires this kind of gesture, you know, uh, the determinism of the gesture, the architectural gesture is, uh, is for all to see, but it's not, I don't see it as a, as a building that is, uh, you know, indifferent to the landscape. No, it's just uh, uh, engaging dynamically the landscape. I think it's a good work by uh, Arthur Erickson. I wouldn't mind studying in such a university building. I was, I, I, I confess. I don't think he did the buildings behind. He just did this one. Uh, it's almost like a bridge in a way, you know, connecting this mound or this hill with the other one and uh, above the valley. And it's good. Now, as an elementary school in Vancouver, 1973. Uh, also, it's not a bad building, you know, and you can imagine that underneath this roof is a, a common a space, common in the sense that it's a public space where children maybe from different classes, classes meet or within one classroom, but it's certainly a, a, a building that encourages a dialogue, uh, interaction. We are talking about interaction. And Imagine you being a student, a pupil in this school. Do you see it's an open, this, these are not enclosed ateliers, you know, like we have here, uh, you know, we, these are not enclosed classrooms, you know, on a corridor. This is an open space for a democratic society, for children who are taught to become open towards others, open to dialogue, open to debating, you see how they sit on the floor, you know, in front of the teacher. It's a different kind of dialogue between professor or teacher and the students. And I think students who grow up in such an environment uh, have the privilege to grow up, encouraged to be open, to take risks, to speak out, to, 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 to encourage and sustain dialogues, and so on, and the big uh, roofing here with a lot of uh, you know, flooding, natural light helps helps them to, 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 to develop in this way. It's a huge difference between this kind of uh, educational environment and having, uh, you know, typical enclosed, uh, morose classrooms aligned on a corridor. It's huge, it's a huge difference.
again, the landscape is magnificent. So, uh, you know, if you want to skip a class and you just exit the building, you are, uh, you know, in the midst of um, almost paradise. But the building also is, is cultivating different values, the, the value of dialogue, of, of togetherness, of interaction. And this is not bad. Look at them. In what school in Romania, students, maybe in kindergartens, maybe. But, uh, you know, look here, you have students of various ages. Maybe, look, they, they are in a circle here. The professor with the students, they are in a circle. You know, while at the same time, some uh, kids or children or pupils are on the floor studying or playing or discussing a very open atmosphere. Uh, and this has a beneficial effect on growing up. A longhouse inspired museum, a Haida longhouse inspired museum of anthropology. This is that building you saw him looking at as a young, handsome man, I thought, uh, at the model of the building. And this is the building. It looks a little bit uh, rigid here from this side because of this repetition, but but from other angles, it looks uh, very spectacular. And, um, you know, it, it's a museum of anthropology that he built. Uh, yes, he, he still uses a lot of glass, which today I would think is rather to be uh, avoided because of the losses of energy and so on. But at that time, uh, not that I tried to justify him, but at that time there wasn't so much concern with, uh, with the issues we are confronted with, that is sustainability, uh, you know, uh, being careful about the levels of energy we, we uh, invoke or we use and so on. But it's an interesting building and he does the same thing here like he did in some houses, you know, he, these elements, you know, unless you know the, the project and the building and the program better, you could say, well, they are just formally, you know, interesting, but what is the function of these things? Um, unfortunately, I cannot answer this question, but I don't think he was just playing with forms here. I think he was uh, referring perhaps to uh, something, something having to do with uh, anthropology. And maybe with the um, you know artifacts or uh, architectures uh, from uh, all the times, it's almost like a temple in a way. You know, it's it's it's. I think it's an interesting building, and in, especially where the symmetry or the the ax, 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 the axis of the front elevation is uh, not seen. Like here, I, I find the, the building more interesting from the side, like here too. But there is a little bit of, um, of stringence, a little bit of insistence on this uh, rhythm that, that could be a little bit, uh, you know, if not overwhelming, uh, uh, even bothering, but I still think it's, it's, it's an interesting building. Uh, what is this, a subway station in Toronto, Ontario, uh, 1978, uh, you know, a subway station doesn't have to be banal and dark, could be interesting, could be architecturally engaging. And uh, I think what we look at here is exactly this. We have again, the structure that, that manifests itself in a dynamic way because of these diagonals. Uh, and otherwise, it's an utilitarian uh, building. Of course, it's a subway station, but uh, I think it's it's well done. He built two, I think, in Toronto. This is one of them. Yes, this is another one, also in Toronto, 1978, a little different from the previous one. Yeah, we, we see something more uh, surrealist in a way, almost psychedelic, isn't it? Now, I don't know if this is how it is in reality or the, or the picture, you know, brought these qualities uh, uh, to the fore. Toronto, Arthur Erickson, a subway station.
Evergreen Building, Vancouver, British Columbia, also um, in, uh, in uh, Canada, 1978. Now, this kind of architecture is very appealing to us, almost, you know, it's it's almost some kind of a, you know, BRK Ingels or big, and then you have the the, the green, uh, you know, climbing on the on the buildings, on the terraces and the balconies. And if this building was built today and made public, we would say, sure, this is the architecture of our time. Although, although again, there is a lot of concrete here, and concrete has problems. I love concrete, especially in its brutalist form, but it pollutes, concrete pollutes. And uh, anyway, even here there is, I would say between the masculine principle and the feminine principle, in his architecture, there is a, a slight, uh, um, a slight preference for um, for uh, what I call masculinism than feminism. They don't seem quite to be in, in balance, but um, not always. In, in, in the case of his private homes, the dialogue with nature, which I kind of consider it feminine, uh, and, um, you know, I mean, nature being feminine and the building being masculine, the the interplay is uh, of equal forces but here in the city i think the sensibility of the building is a little bit uh, uh, dwarfed by uh, masculinism this is my subjective interpretation uh, what is this this is a, a law court in vancouver again uh, uh, it's um, you know it's a, a palace of justice, if you want, you know, in Romanian tribunal. Now imagine going here to have a judicial problem solved. And this roofing, this light, I think encourages you to believe that there will be fairness, that you will not be fearful in such a building because because of this open space and this natural light that is flooded you, uh, flooding you, and it is not an oppressive environment. This is very, very important. Now, this might be a little bit oppressive, the rhythmicity of these structural uh, uh, concrete elements, but the natural light and the vastness of the space seems to promote uh, openness and, and transparency. We are talking about transparency. A judicial process should be transparent, should be fair, you, you know, and the building uh, encourages you to, to think and feel that it will be so. Uh, there are interesting things here, like you see the these stairs. I hope I have another image as well, another image. He's not the only one who used this. I don't know if he was the first one or not. Uh, let's see if I can, yeah, you see here. It's an interesting idea, you know, to combine, you know, the, 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 the quicker uh, climbing of the stairs through here with a slower one uh, diagonally. And I think uh, if, I, if I was to use these stairs, I, I, I would, uh, being that I was born in the Libra zodiacal sign, I would have a hard time to decide which one to, I would probably use this one, the slower one, you know, than the quicker one. But it looks interesting and it functions. It's an interesting idea. Well, let's go back to um, yeah, uh, some of the other images of this um, uh, you know, uh, judicial uh, building. You see, even from the air, it's clear for all that this is the house of transparency because there is a lot of transparency. It's a public building. So it's, it's not about private interest, it's about justice, which concerns us all. And this is what the building seems to uh, suggest and to symbolize and to evoke. Grass again, you know, trying to, trying to soften the image of the harsh concrete. It doesn't always succeed, but it tries. Now, 
Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, again, 1982. Now this building is not one of my favorite buildings, at least towards the outside is very, you know, uh, centripetal and uh, monolithic. Uh, and um, it, it's, it's I, I prefer buildings which are more fragmented it's, it's, you know, some kind of a, you know, it's a huge uh, gathering place, uh, but I find it a little bit too predictable in its centrality and its self-assurance. It's a huge space though. I mean, look at it, you know, it's, it's a huge room. How to fragment it? Well, I, unless you are Hans Sharon, who fragmented beautifully and lyrically uh, the Philharmonia in Berlin, uh, it's not easy to do it, but uh, it can be done. He tried two here at the inside. You see, there are these uh, islands, if I, if I can call them so, which uh, you know, uh, attempt to create multiplicity in unity. The building otherwise outside is, um, I don't know. I mean, yes, you can take interesting pictures of the central space to look at the ceiling and the roofing uh, seen from the inside. And uh, yeah, it is, uh, you know, it is maybe interesting and it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming, it's powerful, it's central, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a little bit overpowering. But maybe if I am to compare this, so it's a city hall, no? Yeah, no, it's a Roy Thompson hall. It's not a city hall. But this kind of monolithic structure, I think, uh, is advocating a type of power, architectural power. I have some troubles with exactly because an excessive, I call it masculinism or centrality, the centrality of power. NAP Laboratories in Cambridge, England, 1983. You know, there are laboratories, a lot of glass, probably the scientists or those people working in the labs complain about so much glass, just as the scientists at the Richards Laboratories in Philadelphia by Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn complained about. In fact, when I visited um, the Richards Laboratories by Louis Kahn in Philadelphia, I noticed that many windows, you know, made of glass, were covered with um, aluminum foil from the inside because the scientists didn't want so much sunlight, sunlight and so on. Uh, here also we have the demagogy of glass, which is uh, asserting itself, uh, you know, continuously. But you know, it seems uh, we still trust glass immensely. Although it's known that glass is giving us the illusion of, of, of having a dialogue with the outside because it's, it's addressing just the eye, but there are great losses of energy through that glass. In the summer, you cannot live without air conditioning and in the winter, you cannot live without heat. And uh, there are losses of heat uh, through that glass. So glass is not a material that reduces the energy costs or product production or use. No, not at all. What is this in Ontario? There's some kind of a high housing complex. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess, but the architecture is not, uh, you know, totally unexpected. It's, uh, yes, it's interesting because of these terraces and the uh, you know, balconies and so on, but it's still kind of a, you know, predictable uh, kind of architecture. But it's better perhaps than, uh, you know, such a blank uh, tower. Uh, these are apartment buildings. A lot of glass here too. Although this is Canada, isn't it? And in Canada, you know, the, the temperatures are not the lowest on earth. Well, if it, if, if it had the lowest, it would, not have been, it would not have been good either. But in the winter, 
you know, you will need a lot of uh, heat in order to compensate for the use of so much glass. Canadian Chancery in Washington, this is a governmental building in Washington, D.C., in the United States from 1989, and governmental it looks. Uh, I guess the building is almost okay, but what bothered me when I made another presentation by him, and it bothers me now as well, is this part, which is too conveniently, you know, I almost said classical, you know, with those round columns, and it's it's uh, it's a touch of uh, authoritarian centrality there, which I, I think is problematic. Otherwise, the building. It's also a touch of postmodernism somehow. You know, this rotunda, rotonda. Uh, it's a little bit uh, uh, using a different architectural language than, than the rest of the building, I feel. Maybe he did it intentionally, but uh, uh, it, it doesn't look too convincing. A civic center, 1989 a huge building. Here again, we see a certain complacency towards uh, absorbing, uh, you know, the, the influences, uh, the vicious influences of postmodernism with these, uh, you know, uh, interpretations of, uh, of columns, you know, historical columns. Uh, it was a difficult time at the time when postmodernism was trying to connect us with the, with the past. And it was understandable in a way because a millennium was ending, the 20th century, but also a millennium, and somehow humanity didn't want to, to end that century. And that's why it looked back. It, it, it had a hard time to contemplate itself jumping into the first century, in, 20, in the 21st century. But in the end, it did. So these columns here, it's, uh, we didn't see them in his earlier works. We saw them in the governmental building in Washington, and we see them here. Yes, postmodernism was fatal to architecture. I, I hate uh, what, uh, what uh, postmodernism do, did to a lot of uh, modern architecture. Yeah, the influence of postmodernism is obvious here as well. And it is obvious in the works of other actually good architects, like for example, James Sterling. A convention center also 1989, San Diego, uh, California. This one is more futuristic and uh, rather interesting. You know, I, I'm not sure very well what's going on in these uh, horizontal cylinders. But uh, they do look uh, engaging and, uh, and uh, you know, interesting. But certainly much more interesting than all the buildings around it. So now we look at this. Is this the tunnel of time or something? You know, I don't know what it is, but uh, it's interesting. Is it enough for an architecture to be interesting? No, but I think. It's important to make a building which is interesting. Uh, you know, if it's just interesting, it's not enough. About great works in art or in literature, music, architecture, you don't say they are just interesting. They are, you, you, you not say that the Ode, Ode of Joy of Beethoven is interesting. It's more than, than interesting. The same, you would not say that the Sistine uh, chapel, you know, uh, what Michelangelo depicted there is interesting. No, it's more than interesting. You didn't say that the, the Egyptian pyramids are interesting. It's more than that. So I think we should aspire towards doing works which are more than just being interesting. On the other hand, we should not aspire towards doing works which are less than interesting. So this is in San, Die San Diego in California, another uh, Californian building here from 1991. Huge, this one as well. What is it? A city hall in Fresno, California. Um, 
yeah, it's, uh, it's now almost overwhelming, although it is rather horizontal. But this cut into the building makes it interesting. Again, uh, Arthur Erickson uh, had, uh, you know, uh, the attributes, uh, and, you know, uh, of a sculptor. And uh, they show in, in most of his buildings, actually. But, but there is a touch of commercialism and uh, predictability and mundanity in his works, which I think is not the highest quality, but he handles them almost, uh, almost uh, convincingly. Because exactly because of this culturalness of his buildings. Arthur Erickson. Now, like go hall in University of California, 1991. Uh, if, we, if we compare this building with the early universities uh, that he built in Canada, I think we feel that something is lost. Well, it's also true that here he didn't benefit of the spectacular landscape and the vastness of the landscape he, he, he worked with or in, in, in Canada. Uh, this is an urban context. It's different, but I don't think his building, um, these buildings are, are as good as the, as the early ones. Two California Plaza in Los Angeles, these are two towers that he built and uh, what can we say, you know? Oh, typical North American office towers, you know, they, they are just, do you see any window here opening? No, no, because like in the buildings by uh, Sir Norman Foster, a huge machinery produces artificially air, but that, that machinery is uh, uh, pro pro provoking and producing pollution and is very, very expensive. And this is certainly not a sustainable build building, nor this one. This kind of all glass facade is not sustainable any longer. We cannot use them like this. We have to go back to smaller windows, maybe even windows that open a different conception of the tower is necessary. These are uh, most to us uh, techno, techno, techno buildings that uh, might look shiny and glittering and perfect somehow in their pristine geometry, but they, 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 uh, they are certainly not uh, uh, conducive with, uh, with our time because of the, the amount of energy they, they, they consume and, lo and lose. Uh, what is this? A library, 1997, University of British Columbia. Here again, a lot of glass, glass, and again glass. And this is Canada, which has strong winters, doesn't it? Which has low temperatures, doesn't it? Well, that glass, but glass in its demagogy keeps seducing us. Although it is a material that provokes a lot of losses of energy. It's, it's too convenient to use glass like this. I understand, you know, it's seductive because we think, you know, through glass, you can see far away and you have the feeling of connecting with everything and everybody. But the truth of the matter is that glass is also a frontier. You can see through it, but you cannot move through it. So in part, at least, it's, it's demagogical. It's majesty glass. Waterfall building, Vancouver, what is this? Again, glass, glass and concrete, concrete and glass. But there are some interesting things here. You see the, the these, uh, uh, staircases uh, hanging up uh, uh, at the top of the building. I hope I have another, you know, it's an interesting idea to, to, to uh, most of the time such stairs are within the apartment because these are apartment. This is an apartment building. He brought them outside. So if you want to go to the terrace, you know, you exit the apartment and the, 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 the stairs become sculptural uh, elements on the facade.
and the and 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 and, and the, you know the attempt to fra fragment the facade is seen here too and i think it has a positive uh, uh, you know, effect uh, on the building otherwise the building is rather simplistic you know a concrete uh, a structure a lot of glass you know these windows it's thanks to these uh, staircases that uh, it becomes a little bit different. What is this? I don't know where it is. Actually, I can read the last word, uh, Heritage Center 2007. Uh, in my opinion, he became, but maybe this is unavoidable as one grows older, one becomes less um, adventurous and the architecture is, uh, you know, a little bit uh, conventional. Uh, yes, uh, it's still here a little bit of a curvature and uh, here another curvature, but that's about it, you know, it's, it's yeah, you look at this building in this corner, which appears to you know, attempt a certain form of expression is, but otherwise the building is uh, rather common, in my opinion. Anyway, but this work from 2009, the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, USA, has some interesting parts. Now, in this case, because it is a museum of glass, maybe it's not so bothering to see so much glass because in a way it's a narrative architecture. This is the museum of glass, so he employs glass. It's just that this glass that we see here, I don't think it has any function. Uh, let's uh, you see. It's interesting, but what are they for here? I don't know. Maybe they have a certain reason to be. They look interesting, yes. You know, although a little bit predictably triangular, and you know, it's a row of such things. This is also interesting with this, uh, you know, uh, inclined um, trunk of a cone. Uh, but uh, yeah, all in all, uh, this is not, uh, you know, this is a, I would say, a more interesting building by him. And again, we see the sculptor in Arthur Erickson. So it's the Museum of Glass, but it could have been here, you know, even a church or a chapel. You know, it, it has an, a level of otherness. In Tacoma, uh, USA. The Museum of Glass, Arthur Erickson, 2009. You know, architecture does, does benefit from being artistically endowed. And if there are, you know, uh, exceptional uh, visual configurations, you know, this is enticing for the eye and for the imagination and, and for the, you know, the desire for otherness that uh, we all have. The Museum of Glass. And now Canada House in Vancouver, also from 2009, but for some reason, now I couldn't find pictures for this one, or I don't know why I don't have pictures. Uh, the Ericsson Vancouver, I don't know what this is. I, I don't have pictures, but I have pictures with this one. It's a project which I think was not yet built. The Trump International Hotel and Tower in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, here it is. Now, this kind of twisted uh, tower was built already even by Calatrava in Malmö in Sweden and others. There are many, maybe not many, but there are several, no, no, almost many uh, uh, twisted uh, skyscrapers, you know, and this one is twisting too, almost uh, predictably. So it's showy, so to speak. And I guess for a showy man like Trump, was uh, kind of, uh, you know, appropriate. Uh, 
but I don't find it as a particularly profound uh, piece of architecture. Now it's rather, you know, commercial. Yes, it's interesting visually, but uh, not sufficiently. And again, and again, that huge surface of glass turns me off because it's uh, it's a cliche, it's a déjà vu, it's it's convenient, but in terms of uh, of energy consumption is uh, disastrous. And uh, so I don't think uh, this kind of building can continue to be built. Trump, huge letters for a huge man. I actually learned that uh, Mr. Trump is one meter and 90 centimeters tall, unless the information is uh, inflated. Um, appreciable, no? One meter and 90 centimeters, the former president of the United States. And this was the tower uh, imagined by uh, Arthur Erickson for the former president of the United States. That's it. Happy, well, he died. I shouldn't say happy. Sorry, he was not born on this day. He died on this day, the 20th of May. Thank you.